Chad Oberhauser. And Chad Oberhauser had an appropriate name because Chad was the biggest guy in our high school. He was big, he was strong, he was totally powerful, he was that guy. Um, I was not friends with Chad, I was not unfriends with Chad, I just didn't know Chad, we didn't walk in the same circles. He was two years older than me, so this one year I remember, he was a junior, I was a freshman, and we happened to be in one class together. Um, he sat near me, and I got to uh, be in a couple groups with Chad and do a few things with Chad, but wasn't the greatest of friends. Now, Chad, um, in his large size, uh, he was a, one of, a defensive lineman on the varsity football team. The coaches loved him because he was skilled and he was fast and he was big and he was powerful and he was an excellent player. And everybody knew that he was the biggest guy in our high school. So one day, our, um, our math teacher, Mr. McNeil, who himself was just a fun guy, uh, he was the opposite of the biggest guy in the school. He was short. He was uh, 50s or 60s or so in age. He wore black wire rim, corn rim glasses. Uh, and he always had a smirk on his face. Like he always wanted to make math fun somehow. Well, there's one day that Mr. McNeil was trying to teach something. I still don't know what, but he was trying to teach us something and make it fun. And so he called up Chad. And he asked, once Chad got up to the front of the room, he asked for the heaviest backpack in the room of the students, something filled with lots of books. And so Mr. McNeil went around the room and he tried to find the heaviest backpack. And he finally found the one that he thought was the heaviest, which Mr. McNeil could hardly lift. But he then brought it to Chad and said, Chad, I need you to lift this backpack with a straight arm. You cannot bend your elbow. Straight arm. And I need you to lift it 10 times. And so I remember just sitting there near Chad, just going. Because <laughs> I'm not the biggest guy in the school. He is definitely the biggest guy in the school. And we were all looking at him thinking, how do you do that? And we were just, this guy is powerful. The Bible talks a lot about power and about strength. And it has to do with power that God gives us. And it has to do with God's power and what God does with power. Because there's issues with power all around us. You know, there's people who have power in our lives and they don't use it well. There's people who try to have power over you and me. There's people who try to play with their power in inappropriate ways. There's people who look at God's power and think that it's not power. There's all kinds of power going on. And I think if we've learned anything about the big picture of the Bible as we've looked through the Bible, it's that God has ultimate power. And God wants us to know that God alone has ultimate power. This, I think, is one of the key things that Daniel contributes to our understanding of who God is as we read through the Bible. But it also has to do, not just with power, it has to do with how this power played out. Uh, you remember, if you were with us the past well, couple months, we've looked at this whole issue of the promised land. Anybody remember thinking about or looking at the promised land? Okay, at least a few of you have gotten this message, because we've looked at it four times. <laughs> Hopefully it's not getting old. But we've looked at the promised land because it is hugely important to God's whole story. Uh, the promised land is this realm or this space that God set up that God led God's people into. God prepared them for it. God gave them experiences to get ready for it. God led God's people into the promised land. It was a beautiful place. It was a place where people wanted to live. It was a place that supplied people's needs. It was a, an enviable place. But the place was more than that. This space, this place that God led his people had to do with something because it communicated a greater thing that God wanted them to understand. Do we remember that greater thing that the promised land communicated? It was a picture of what? It was a picture of what a relationship with God is all about. In all the beauty and all the joy and all the peace and all the security, this land helped people think and feel and understand what God wanted them to know about what a relationship with God is like. They were living it when they were living in this space. The problem was 
when they were taken away from their space, they felt the opposite. When they were in the space, they felt like God is nearby. God is close. God is doing God's things. We're in this relationship. But when they were taken out of that space, they felt the opposite. They felt like, where is God? What on earth is God doing? Does God even hear us? What's happening? We don't feel like God is even close by. So when they're in the promised land, it seemed like things were happening that don't happen in other places. It's special. And when they were taken out of the land, it felt like things are not happening that are special because we are separated from this kind of space. The second of the two times that God's people were taken out of the land is what Daniel describes in his book. And it's the situation that Gail just described. The nation is conquered, and they're taken to Babylon, and there's this King Nebuchadnezzar, and King Nebuchadnezzar is this picture of power. He wants all the power. And because he just conquered God's people and brought millions of them to him, he's even more powerful because there's more people who are following him and trying to, and he's trying to get to obey him. So this guy is a power-hungry guy. And he has taken people out of their space into a space where they don't feel like God is anywhere nearby. The promised land, I think, is a lot like cell phone coverage. <laughs> because when you're in the land, you feel a certain way. And when you're out of the land, you feel another way. See, a long time ago, I used to work for a company that installed cell phone antennas. And this is like 15 years ago when all the networks were trying to build up their nationwide networks. And so what I learned were two simple things about cell phone coverage. I learned that cell phone coverage is all about coverage and capacity. Capacity is the capacity that an antenna has to dole out data and receive data. So there's only a certain number of people that can be on the phone or can be texting or emailing or surfing a web in a certain area. If there's too many, the antenna can't handle it. And so that's capacity. It gets overused. And so that's when, the, when your phone gets sluggish, or that's when you drop a call, or that's when you can't surf the web like you want. That's capacity. The other issue is coverage. And so all the networks want to have antennas that are in such a network where they overlap, where there's always coverage no matter where we go. So there's no occasion for a dropped call. There's no occasion where we can't check our email or anything else. They want total coverage. So for example, here's uh, what AT&T's coverage map of the United States looks like. The green is where there's coverage, and the uh, empty space is where there isn't any, and the red is where there's mild coverage. Uh, just for the fun of comparison, uh, here's Verizon's. And just for the fun, here's Sprint's. So just a little bit to be out when we want to best friends. So, but this is what coverage looks like. And this is how the networks picture coverage. In the time of the book of Daniel, when people were outside the promised land, it's like they were in one of those colorless dead zones. They had no coverage. Because God wasn't nearby. God wasn't hearing them from their perspective. They couldn't get through to God. They kept saying, you know, do you hear me now? Because God wasn't nearby. That's how they felt. They were out of coverage. And so they felt displaced. They felt like God was not nearby and God was not hearing them. So this king is the one who seems to have all the power during this time. And he took them away and he's the one that they're supposed to obey. So he builds this statue, orders people to bow down to it. And here's what Nebuchadnezzar says to these three guys who don't bow down that we just saw. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage at these guys not standing, and he ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Now, if I've ever heard one, that's a challenge. Is your God able to rescue you from my 
power. Wow. Because all throughout the Bible, God has been describing that God has ultimate power. You know, back to creation, the power to create the world. To the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. To the Exodus, where God splits water and brings hundreds of thousands of people across. I mean, time and again, God is saying, I am the number one God with ultimate power. Worship only me alone. So Nebuchadnezzar's words probably don't sit too well with God. So the three guys respond. One more time. This is the passage that Gail read. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power and your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. This might be the best lesson on power that's out there. I mean, if you ask the average person in that day, would God be able to save these three guys from the furnace? The answer would probably be no. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is, it was a blazing hot furnace that people who even got close to melted. So how could you be in the furnace and not melt away? It was just logically speaking, they would not survive. But the second reason is because they're not in the promised land. It wouldn't make sense that God would show up because they're not in God's space. So they're far away from God. Why would God rescue them? They're not in that zone where God does God's miraculous work. But if Daniel says anything, Daniel says that God can be powerful anywhere. Not just in that space that they think God can be powerful. God can truly be powerful anywhere, even in the spaces where we least expect God to be powerful. God's power doesn't just show up in the places where we've seen it before or we expect it to show up. God's power can show up anywhere. Where have we been praying for people and we haven't seen results or we haven't seen God's power? Can God's power still show up there? Where have we not seen God work in a long, long time? Can God's power still show up there? I mean, Daniel would say, yes, God's power can happen anywhere, even if it doesn't feel like God is near. God's power is everywhere. Well, there's also some steep competition for this power with this king, because this king wants all the power. He's used to being in charge. He's used to being number one. He's used to everyone bowing down to him. He's used to saying something, and everybody follows, and everybody obeys. He's also probably on a high from conquering this nation and bringing all these people back to his nation, because now he's in charge of more people. And so, as a reminder, listen to what he says as this last line uh, in Nebuchadnezzar. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? What God will be able to rescue you from my power? Man, that's harsh. That's arrogant. That's saying, I've got it all, and you don't stand a chance, and you don't have nothing. You have nothing. And once again, God only accepts one place, and it's the top of the podium. It's number one. It's chief place in our lives. If God truly is the one who created the world, who wants a relationship with us, who says that his arms are underneath us and surrounding us, that God is more powerful than anyone, even the ones who claim to have power. Even when it seems that somebody else has the power, or somebody else is holding all the cards, or somebody else is in charge, or all those other trends seem to be more exciting or popular than God, God says, no, I still am more powerful than anyone. Nobody else stands a chance. And God uses Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they're in this fire, they're doing the unlikely, God saves them, God shows a nation of people who is powerful. They say, God is more powerful than anyone. So what would have happened if God had not saved these three guys? Would anything have changed in what we learn or what Daniel teaches from this story? 
Well, it's interesting. At the end of these three guys' response, let's read what they say. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But, even if he doesn't, we still want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They believe that God's going to rescue them. They think it's going to happen. But they also say, if it doesn't, that doesn't change a thing. Because it's not about whether God saves us in this moment. We still believe all these things about God can be powerful anywhere, and God is more powerful than anyone. This moment doesn't change that. Even though we believe He will. But even if He doesn't, it doesn't change it. See, it's not just God's power that God wants us to trust in. It's not just the miraculous great moments that God wants us to be built up by. God doesn't want us to hang on to only those things as reasons for our faith. God doesn't want us just to have faith in God's power. God wants us to have faith in Him. And that means no matter what God does or doesn't do, God wants us to have faith in Him. I mean, it's kind of like a relationship. It's a relationship, uh, you know, relationships that are that are, have a lot of gift giving in them. If you're if your love language, if you if you do love languages, if your love language is gift giving, you might get or receive a lot of gifts. Or if you have a relationship with somebody where you get or give a lot of gifts, it's a lot of fun to get or to give gifts. But we all know a relationship is not based on the gifts, because the gifts can never be enough. There can never be enough of them, and they can never be good enough. The relationship is based on the person. And our faith is not based on the gift of God's power. Our faith is based on God. Who gives the power? The power is a reminder of how good God is and how much God loves us. And it points to the relationship that God wants to have with us. And if there's ever a big picture, that's the big picture. That God wants and will do anything to have a relationship with you and me. The power just makes it better and it points to what God really wants. Let's pray.